Welcome back to Behind the Bastards in our spooky week the Halloween podcast edition. Uh, this week, in addition to talking about a very spooky episode, we are based and Paul F. Tompkins pilled. Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for taking my pill. <laughs> you do offer a lot of pills. It sucks because there's like, there's two hands, there's there's two pills, and then I come in with my pill and I'm like, can I stick my hand in there and hopefully somebody will pick it? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh! I enjoy Paul, that. Paul, 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 I Paul. Know. I know. How are you doing? Well, you know, I after our uh, part one, mm -hmm. uh, I really had to take uh, an industrial shower um, and just really think about were humans a mistake? Um, and so I've gotten, I've just done a lot of thinking, a lot of soul searching, and I think. I've come around to feel that people are, are you know, basically good. And uh, I'm ready with that attitude to go into part two. Wow. That is... Um, brave. Brave. Yeah. Heroic, even. Uh, oh, boy. You don't uh, think it was a mistake, do you? Well... He killed Santa. He did murder Santa Claus. Uh, I just got it out of my mind. <laughs> he, he did. He did kill the living embodiment yes. of childhood wonderment. He killed Santa okay. because he was jealous that the kids he was molesting would like Santa they more liked, than him. They liked an idea of a person, and he couldn't take it. That is like, I think if you were to explain that somehow to Hitler, like pre <sighs> losing his mind, Hitler, Hitler would be like. Well, that's a bit much. Yeah, <laughs> like that's that's a bit far. Oh, it can it can go there. I didn't even think yeah. about that. Ooh. Oh boy. <laughs> maybe I'll, maybe I'll try painting again. Yeah, back to painting. So by the time Pinochet had solidified his grip on power in the mid 1970s, Colonia Dignidad was almost a state within a state. They had built a power plant, a television station, and two airstrips to transport the timber, wheat, corn, and bratwurst the community produced. Since fucking was more or less verboten, the workforce Paul Schaefer needed to accomplish all this was built up through a novel method, abducting children who went to his hospital. <laughs> So, like, he's like, okay, kids, kids have to come here. Yeah, they have to. They need to go to the hospital. They're kids. And I mean, I'm kind of the king. So mm -hmm. I guess uh, I can make these kids uh, do whatever I want. I can make them disappear. Yeah. Um, let's try it and see how it goes. Let's try That's, it and see how it goes. I need someone to build seemed, my airstrip. Yeah, he seemed very willing to say, you know what? This is nuts, but mm -hmm. uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But if it that does. That is, you've hit upon, Paul. One of the common through lines that all of our most dangerous bastards have, you can draw this to guys like Donald Trump, guys like Hitler, mm. a big part of their whole MO is just like, I wonder if I can get away with this. Yeah. I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah. I'm going to give it a shot, you know? Um, if I, I, I probably can't. Yeah. I probably can't. And if I, if I can't, then I'll say like, hey, I tried it. <laughs> Yeah. But if I do, if I do get away with this, I mean, oh, amazing. <laughs> I, and, and the, the thing is, it's living your life that way is incredible advice for like yeah. a career. Like it, it is like if you if you're a creative or something like, oh, you think you might want to write a novel? Give it a shot. Do it. You know, yeah. um, you think you want to do stand up? Go out there and do some stand up. You know, yeah. um, you know, you think you're good enough to be in professional sports? Well, fucking try, you know, see yeah. if you can like. Um, and like in personal lives, like, oh, OK, well, you think you're into that person? Go up and ask him out, you know, um, like it's not bad life advice. It's just these kind of people take it to the extent of like, I bet I could build my own power plant and have a totally yeah. self-sufficient torture commune in the middle of Chile that I, I keep manned by abducting children at the hospital yeah, that there's I no, operate. There's no tryouts for cults. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't go audition to be a cult leader. That's a thing. There's you no have internship to do. program. Exactly. <laughs> and I feel like I feel like once you get the cult formed, mm -hmm. then the sky's the limit, really. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get it going, it builds yeah. inertia, you know? These people, if these people are going to listen to me this far, mm -hmm. let, let's see what this baby can do. Yeah, let's, let's, let's get this thing on the fucking highway, yeah, yeah, you know? Let's open her up, absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, 
The Colonial Hospital was absolutely essential to thousands of people in the working area, and since it received government funding, the state had no interest in providing people with a second option. As a result, when young boys were admitted for health problems and caught Schaefer's eye, they were simply taken from their families. If said families, who were very generally impoverished villagers, complained, Schaefer would be like, well, you got other kids, right? Do you want them to have medical care? And again, one of the things that's fucked, like, this is fucked up for a thousand reasons. This is an oriboros <laughs> of fucked up in this. I learned about this particular aspect of the cult from a harrowing interview in that Netflix documentary series about the Colonia. And the boy relating this story says, I would have died from the health issue that brought me to the hospital. They saved my life and then abduct me so, so I could be molested for years. God like, damn. It's fucking, <laughs> it's... Something else, Paul. <laughs> wow. That reminds me of something I, I once heard um, uh, someone say in an interview. Um, you know, I, I don't remember how they got to this in the conversation, but this person was saying, yeah, it would have been, I, I think it would have been okay if I'd never been born, like considering <laughs> how my life has gone and yeah. uh, the pain that's been in it. Like if I'd never been born at all, that might've been better. And I, I, that never left my mind. Like to yeah. feel that way is uh, extremely profound. And to save a child's life for that, like how does that not, I, I don't know how those things happening to you, like it's bad enough to just be molested, but to have been brought from the brink of death in order to be molested, yeah. the, 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 psycho, the, the, the psychological damage that that does, I don't know how you're not thinking of that every moment of the day for the rest of your life. Yeah, like just getting up in the morning with that yeah. in your background yeah. requires a tremendous amount of just like, because we all know, everybody says like the universe is unfair, but mm. usually you're saying that from like your home with air conditioning and heating and like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like with yeah. fully fed and stuff like, yeah, that's, um, somebody who knows intimately yeah it's real unfair <laughs> like it is a fucked up roll of some bad dice Ooh. um so good for that person for being i mean whatever else happened in their life they were like they had processed it enough to sit down to net with netflix and like explain what happened to them yeah so i got nothing but respect for anybody who yeah. survives that absolutely um incomprehensible <laughs> like Good Lord. Um, so any locals who might feel inclined to complain about the situation at this point are not just running up against the fact that this is their only hospital in the area and whatnot. These people have money. Um, but the fact that Paul Schaefer now has the direct support of the unquestioned dictator of the entire country. He doesn't just have people on the right wing who like him now. The guy running the country is his personal like possession Augusto Pinochet is his homeboy. For his part, the general allowed the colonial to import and export without paying taxes. Some of these benefits Schaefer extended to local farmers. So Pinochet's like, hey, you don't got to worry about taxes. Import, export, whatever you want. You got your own airstrips. You don't have to worry about customs duties. And one of the ways Schaefer builds local support is he goes to these farmers in the area, kind of like the big local, like the Chileans in the area who have influence. And he's like, hey, you want to be able to sell your shit for without customs duties? I'll let you use my airport for free. But if anything happens, you got my back, you know? He's <laughs> I'm not saying anything's going to happen. And but. I'm not going to say what types of things are going to happen. But if anything happens, I mean, this really, this really does like, you know, it, it, it really plays on how grateful are these people to have free... <laughs> Free healthcare, like yeah. Free healthcare, where it's like you may hear that I'm a child molester. Like, yeah, you may hear that I have been operating a child molestation engine at an yeah. unfathomable scale. But think um, of your savings. But, but yeah, you're not. You, remember when your daughter broke her leg? That shit was free. <laughs> like, um, oh. Yeah, it's uh, it's wild. And these these local farmers who he's he gets, you know, in bed with kind of not literally um, some of these like these guys will defend him when like j foreign journalists will come in to try to investigate what the fuck's going on here. And they've got his back like it's a very hostile place to be looking into the colonia. <sighs> so man. Schaefer becomes the total like almost God to his followers. They called him our eternal uncle, which. You can make a 
a not creepy uncle joke here, but we shan't. Um, is, I mean, is this where they started? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, our eternal uncle. I might have some notes. Uh, they also called him the supreme leader, which is a little more traditional. Um, daily prayer meetings served as a way for Schaefer to institute strict groupthink and destroy any bonds besides the bond between him and his flock. He repeatedly forced his followers to repeat a definition of the word family that he said he'd found in the Bible. He would ask, who are my mother and father? And his congregation would respond, those that do the work of God. Okay, so it, at this point, there is still some sort of um, uh, Christianity aspect to this. Yeah, cult. there always is. There always right. is. Um, so they're having services and you know yeah. doing that sort of thing. But really, it's all about him. It's all about him. It's Christianity yeah. as filtered through this pedophile. <laughs> like, yeah, he's he's yeah. he's the instrument of God for them. Yeah. But essentially, he is their God. Yeah, it's like somebody distilled the Catholic Church <laughs> into a into a hard liquor. Oh, God. <laughs> so <laughs> the process of having his followers confess their sins was formalized in a practice he called Seelisorge. I'm not, I don't speak German, uh, which apparently means care of the soul. Confessions were supposed to happen as close to the moment of the sin as possible, but Schaefer would also require his followers to meet with him and each other in small groups repeatedly throughout the day in order to give confession. Public confessions in mass were held at lunch and dinner. Members of the community would be expected to write the names of sinners, themselves and people they'd seen sin, on oh. a blackboard near the entrance to the cafeteria. When everyone sat down, Schaefer would read the names listed on the board while everyone ate. Every sinner was required to stand up and confess their sins. You were not allowed to deny sinning. So if somebody else just writes your name and you don't know what the fuck they're talking about, mm. you have to come up with something. Like, yeah. You have to like, this, you have to. This, yeah, that reminds me of confession when I was a kid. And like, what had I done? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, going in, but you had to go every week. And so sometimes you just make stuff up, um, like mild things, like I took the Lord's name in vain, or I disrespected my father or whatever, because you can't just, <laughs> it just seemed without being told, you knew, I can't just go in there and say, I'm great. You know, I, I, that I, I kept it a hundred this week. Yeah. You had to, you had to come up with something. Yeah. yeah you can't walk into confession and be like, you know what? I na I'm nailing it right now, bro. Yeah. Like, Doing great. No notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just so, it, it's also so weird. Cause it is like, I mean, as, as a kid, I remember being terrified of like minor sins that it was going to go to hell. Of for course. Like, yes. Yeah. Like some, some stupid bullshit. Like, mm -hmm. um, but as an adult, it's like. If there's God, he's got other shit going. Like, there's a lot happening right now. Like, it, yeah. it's like walking in on a guy as he's like watching a genocide occur and being like, <laughs> hey, you know what, man? I was lusting a little bit earlier today. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Let me make a note of that. Oh, sorry. One second. They're shooting yeah. the children again. <laughs> I'm, I'm in seventh grade and I saw a bra strap and uh, <laughs> I got excited. Is that... Did you have time for that right now? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I was I was paying attention to some stuff in Bosnia, but let me just drop all that right now and <laughs> focus on this. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to do the same thing for both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what an easy gig. <laughs> <laughs> Rwandan genocide and cheated on a math test. Yeah. <laughs> same it requires the same thing from me. Consider them taken care of. Yeah. I made a note of it. <laughs> oh, it's very funny. So what's not funny is all of this. So <laughs> Yeah, um, everybody's got to like come up with something to confess. And on Sundays, everybody's got to go next to uh, Schaefer's house to confess yet again and pray for forgiveness. So they're spending all of their time that's not working confessing, basically. <laughs> now, again, they're supposed to make a confession in the moment when they sin. And Schaefer's not always going to be available for everybody. There's hundreds of people on the compound. He's a busy man, got a lot of crimes against humanity to commit. So if a sin occurs outside of one of those regular meetings, followers were expected to confess to the nearest fellow resident who was expected to inform Schaefer of the sin immediately. This led to a thriving economy in betrayal because people who came to Schaefer to inform him of the unreported sins of other residents were, were rewarded by having their own sins forgiven without punishment. So if you tell Schaefer about something bad someone else did that they didn't tell him about, 
you get a free forgiveness. You don't have to, because there's punishments, right? You don't have to take the punishment. <laughs> oh my God. I know. It's pretty bad. This is like one of those things where it really, it really depends on nobody talking to each other about yeah. this stuff. Well, if two people talk, that's the devil. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Punishments for sins ran the gamut from restrictions on food, extra hard labor, or simply being berated in front of the group to being electrocuted with cattle prods and forced to take tranquilizers. Some laborers, including children, were force-fed tranquilizers and then made to work industrial jobs with heavy machinery, like operating wood saws at the mill, which is, I don't know if you know much about saws that are the size of cars, but you shouldn't be on pills when you operate them. <laughs> A lot of people say that. Um, and so people get injured and dismembered all the time. Now, we talk about this a lot, and I hope, I think my regular listeners probably don't labor under this misapprehension. But a lot of people do have the idea that like folks who wind up stuck in this situation are have some sort of like, they're they're dumb or they're weak. There's something some flaw in them that allowed them to become dominated in this way. And first of all, I think that's kind of victim blaming. But second, I think it misses. Number one, these aren't dumb people. They have their own power plant. Like yeah. <laughs> that yeah. they built and operate yeah. themselves. Absolutely. They have their own airstrips and like yeah. manage air travel. And like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. For, yeah, like they know what they're, they're, these are very intelligent, motivated people who are completely dominated by this yeah. guy. And in order to explain how that can happen, I want to read a quote from Bruce Falconer in The American Scholar. He, he does a really good job of laying this out. In Santiago in early 2006, I spoke with Dr. Niels Biedermann, a Chilean psychiatrist who, in association with the German embassy, had been making monthly trips to Colonia Dignidad to study the psychology of its inhabitants. This is after Schaefer is gone. He offered observations from his work. Everything was done to further the religion, he explained. Like in any sect, the colonos, that's the members of the colony, the colony, had a spiritual leader in Paul Schaefer, to whom they formed a very strong attachment. There was a complex network of emotional connections in the colonia. It was not a concentration camp system in which prisoners tend to think of themselves as individuals. It was a community, and the children suffered most of all. The pilgrims may have come to Chile for their religion, but once they were there, they became prey to a brutal and relentless cult of personality. The older colonos punished the younger ones under orders from Schaefer, Biederman continued. They were also the ones who were supposed to educate them. This involved keeping them away from their families, keeping them active all day, and principally keeping them obedient and disciplined. They did whatever they needed to do, including psychopharmacology and electric shock. Over time, physical coercion became less necessary as the social system became rooted in the psyche of the individual. So a lot of this torture is front-loaded. It's like an attack dose of a drug in order to, like, you don't have to after a certain point. Everyone is so inundated by the system that there's not resistance. There aren't kinks in it. For most people, it works. Like uh, Again, I mean, this is the thing is that I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone of, of victim blaming uh, people yeah. in cults, because I think your mind, of course you go right away to what if it were me and yeah. well, that wouldn't happen to me and blah, blah, yeah, blah. I wouldn't do this. Yeah. yeah. But it's like the, the, the way these work is because these people are it, the, these hideous geniuses who have figured this out. Sometimes it's simpler than other times. Sometimes it's like, they just know that it's, if I just reinforce this thing over and over again, that'll wear people down. It gets into their brains. But sometimes a guy like this comes along where it's like the 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 way he has he has foreseen and forestalled every opposition to to uh, to the programming is terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's very. Um, he's, he's just good at it. And, and that's yeah. the thing, like it's these people don't think of it when they're asked to do something, when they're working these hours, when they're, when they're, they're being separated from like their kids, they're not thinking of it as a, as a punishment. Yeah. They're not thinking of it as this is what Schaefer's doing to me. They're thinking about this is what I am doing mm -hmm. for my, the community. Yeah. And people will by and large do pretty much anything for their community. Mm -hmm. Um, if they have one, if they don't, um, I don't know, see the United States of America. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, Schaefer came to consider sexual intercourse a tool of the devil, as we have already discussed. The problem with this is that people fuck. I don't know if you're aware of this, Paul, but like, they sure do. They sure, they do. sure do. They I'm sure not, do. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I yeah. fuck myself. 
Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's uh, yeah. I said it broke on mic. Podcast history here. <laughs> <laughs> TMZ's front page. I want you to isolate that. Use it as a drop. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, no matter what restrictions you try to put on it, people are not going to not fall in love. Even if you completely separate men from women, uh, they're they're gonna find a way. Like yeah. life finds a way. You know, uh, <laughs> as 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 a, a mathematician once said. <laughs> uh, Obviously, Paul Schaefer tried to stop this. He punished men and women who were caught together viciously. Enti an entire family would be shunned if their daughter had like a kiss with a boy. Like your whole family is in is in trouble if that kind of stuff happens. Um, but still, people found ways to do it. And there was also a situ there were also situations in which Paul had to allow it. This increasingly becomes a thing the longer the colonia gets. He can't stop everybody from doing this because wow. he needs a lot of these people. There are men and women in the colonia who, though loyal to him, are too valuable to control totally. There's doctors and nurses. Everything rides on these people, mm -hmm. these skilled professionals. And they do have, like, if you are an MD... You can leave and find something else to do, you know, <laughs> like, right. like you don't you don't have to do this shit. Yeah. Um, you have a lot more leverage than other people. Um, and so in order to stop there from being kind of a power struggle with these folks, Schaefer would allow some of these people to marry if they asked. Now, some of them, like uh, the guy we talked about, Hop, who's like the head doctor, he gets pretty much to live a normal life broadly. Like he's at the top of this cult, too. He's not molesting kids, I don't think, but he he's kind of co-leading things. He has a lot of autonomy. Um, other people generally had less, but of these people who are kind of more privileged, they could go to Schaefer. You couldn't say, I'm in love with this person and I want to marry them. But you could say, I, I think God wants me to marry, right? Um, and they would go to Schaefer, they would say this, and it would Schaefer's job then, if this was someone that he was decided to let marry, to pick the person that they were going to marry. Oh. Um, now, Maybe sometimes people, he, he picked people that they wanted to marry. As a general rule, though, he used this as a situation to exert more control. Bruce Falconer describes it as a, a kind of sexual roulette where you were just sort of hoping that he would pick someone you actually wanted to be with. Um, but the way Schaefer usually did it, again, unless someone was high, important enough that he couldn't fuck with them, he would pick a woman that you couldn't possibly have a child with, Right. Like, that was a big part of it, because he doesn't want people having families. He doesn't want people having kids. So how um, would he determine that? Well, it's if, easy. If if the woman's been through menopause, right? Okay. you're not. So if some 20-year-old who's got, like, a right. valuable skill is like, I want to get married, he's like, here, marry this 65-year-old woman. Right. Like, that's right, your wife right, right. now, right? Like, so it's this. <laughs> um, the strategy was effective. Only 60 or so children were born during the entire span Schaefer ran Colonia Dignidad, which was more than 30 years. And again, a couple hundreds of like 300 something people here. Between 1975 and 1989, no children were born there at all. So this what? is an extremely successful control regime. He has a lot of control here. Wow. What I mean, like, what if he had thought about making a, a car that ran on water. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? You, you do have to think about like, what could this man <laughs> yes. have done? Yeah. How many diseases could have been eradicated? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the amount of human ingenuity, mm -hmm. we would be doing Star Trek shit now. If every yeah. one of these guys and there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, we, we talk, our, our, our business is talking about these guys. Every one of these guys with this level of dedication had instead been like, yeah, fusion seems like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even, even just to be like the head of the department, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, you not even to like that as a scientist, shit. just yeah. to organize it. Yes. Yeah. And to yeah. motivate people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If Donald Trump had dedicated every aspect of his charisma to feeding the poor, we would have a lot less starving poor people in the world because yeah. he's yep. good at motivating a certain mm. subject of people. Yeah. Um, I, I remember thinking that if he had... When when COVID hit us, and if he yeah. had said, you know, we're going to John Wayne this, and we're going to do yeah. it better than anybody, we're yeah, going to beat this thing faster, like, but no, it's not real. No. It's going to be no. over soon. <laughs> yep. No, it's. But no, chug your bleach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know who else wants you to drink bleach, Paul? Oh, God. No, who? No. The products and services no, that support that. Are no, we not? No. Are we not sponsored by Clorox anymore, Sophie? We're not. We're not sponsored by Clorox anymore, Robert. Mm. Well, 
you know, Paul, have I told you about my 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 signature cocktail, Paul? I see you're drinking out of a very fancy goblet here, and I wonder well, if yeah, you it's nothing but might the best be for interested. You. I yeah. would love to hear about it, sure. <laughs> it's called a 2021 highball. Now, here's what you do, Paul. You get a pint glass, and mm-hmm. you fill that 80% of the way up with pure sparkling 409. And then... <laughs> Just a drop of bleach. And you want to keep a bottle of vermouth nearby. Open it up. Don't pour it in. Just have it nearby, kind of like a good martini. Mm-hmm. And then you chug that whole thing as fast as you can. That's a 2020 highball. And let me tell you, at the end of a long day, it's just what it's just what you need. If, if I you. don't if I don't have 409, is fantastic an, an acceptable substitute? Well, Paul, that's that's uh, you, you don't know this, but that's actually very offensive to my to my culture. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> I do apologize. <laughs> now, if you want a 2020, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know enough <laughs> drink names. All right. Well, we. <laughs> You can tell one of us is a professional improviser. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, let's go to some ads. We're back. And Paul, you mentioned a, a specific cleaning product that mm. often comes, you know, the giant jugs that like those, the kind of like the, the, like if you, if you, if you go to like a Mexican market and you get like the big cleaning supplies and the huge yes. tubs that are like purple and stuff. Yes, I think yes. Fantastico is one. When I was in Baja a few years ago, I was living with our friend, David Bell, who's, who is a, a writes for Cody Johnson's outfit and, and does his own podcasts. He's been a guest on the show. I found something called Mezcalito, which is a horrible, it's like mezcal flavoring in sugar and liquor, and it's this color of yellow that looks radioactive, and it's sold in the same bottles they sell cleaning supplies in. <laughs> I bought him a jug of it, and for like a month, it would just gradually decrease as he would drink it, and I'm sure it took years <laughs> off of his life. I apologize to his mother for it. Um, but <laughs> Wow. Uh, I miss it. Paul. Ready to get back into this? Yeah, Robert, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's, let's put this some bitch to bed. Mm-hmm. Now, in the rare occasions where a woman did get pregnant at the Colonia, Schaefer would order her isolated from the community, kept in solitude until she gave birth. The child was taken from her immediately and put with nurses who would care for and raise the child, while the woman went immediately back to work. As you might expect... People born and forced to live in such circumstances did not always turn out to be the apex of mental health. (laughs) Turns out it's bad to separate children from people who love them and force them to live in a barracks. Jesus Christ. Who could have known? Um, It also turns out that it's unfortunately pretty easy to make people who've already been manipulated to accept the torture and repeated assault of their loved ones. Uh, It's easy to make those people torture strangers for profit. And that brings us back to Augusto Pinochet. Germany and Chile actually had a long military history together prior to the Cold War. In 1871, the Germans beat the French in a little scuffle called the Franco-Prussian War. Prior to this, if you were a new country, and again, colonialism is like fading away in a lot of Latin America during the 1800s, right? All these different countries are getting their independence and stuff. And they're all like figuring out, like thrust into the modern world independent, like, well, we need an army now. Who's going to train them? At the start of the 1800s, it's the French, right? The French ha- are historically, like, this gets ignored a lot because of how World War II goes. But, like, for most of modern history, the French are, like, the army guys. Like, the best soldiers in the world, a lot of people consider them. That shit changes in 1871. And all of these Latin American nations that had lusted after getting, like, French people to train their armies start hiring Germans. Um and that's where the kind of relationship with um, uh, between Chile and Germany starts. So a lot of German military advisors, Prussian officers, are the ones who form the Chilean armed forces in the late 19th century. And it actually, if you want to know, like, how did a fascist take power in Chile? Well, all of the guys who built the Chilean military, which is responsible for the coup, were guys who later were Nazis. And sometimes some of them were Nazis when they were doing it. So like, yeah, it it, it makes sense. Um, During the Second World War, uh, a new lieutenant general uh, who had been trained by German officers named Augusto Pinochet sympathized with the Nazis and expressed his enchantment with Erwin Rommel, easily the fifth or sixth most overrated general officer in that war. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, now people, you don't need to be snarky, Robert. I bring the Rommel shade. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> anyway, um, we've already discussed the privileges Pinochet gave the colony, but those privileges did come with a responsibility. As I introduced in the last episode, Colonia Dignidad's expertise in torture made them a perfect auxiliary to the DINA, uh, or DINA, um, Pinochet's secret police force. We don't know how many people they tortured, um, but thousands maybe? Like, a lot. They tortured a shitload of people. And one of the people they, and by the way, this is actually, again, some of these people are, a lot of these people are former Nazis. A lot of people organized, and we don't know what all of them did during the war. Um, but there's an ugly and a, a pretty global history of former Nazis specifically being the people who helped train secret police for dictators to torture. And the U.S. supports a number of these guys. In fact, Syria's infamous Sednaya prison, and it's incredibly, Syria has one of the most, like, horrific torture programs of any nation today. Um, it was all organized by a former member of the SS who like put together their torture program and the United States funded it from 2004 to like 2009 or 10 because we would take people we captured in Iraq and we would send them over to Syria because we didn't couldn't torture them the way that the Syrians could torture them. Robert, um, wait, 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 wait. You're talking about the United States of America? Of America. Yes, that's right. Well, that's, but that's right. That's the country where I live. I know. Um, and it turns out, I mean, we were also funding Pinochet while he was using Nazis to torture people. So we we do uh, this well, a lot. I, well, I, I hope we don't do it anymore. No, ne this is this. I think it's safe to say that the 1970s was the last time the United States <laughs> did anything questionable in Latin America. For sure, <laughs> It has been nothing but smooth sailing. <laughs> exactly. Well, we got that out of our system. Yeah. Look, it's like, uh, you know, you got to you got to you got to I don't know. I don't know what else it's like. <laughs> <So> <laughs> One of the people tortured uh, at the Colonia Dignidad was a guy named Louis Peebles. Uh, he was, which is tragic story, but very funny name. Um, he survived, <laughs> so we can laugh at the fact that his sure. name is Louis Peebles. Um, Peebles, again, amazing, was the former <laughs> commander of a left-wing militia. Um, you have to really be a frightening man if you're a militia leader named Peebles and people take you seriously. <laughs> like you, you, That's an extra like boy named Sue level of like... Yeah, don't laugh it at is, the name. <laughs> it is funny that I never thought twice about the name Van Peebles, but Peebles by itself, yeah, it's absurd. Yeah, and Louis Peebles, Louis P. <laughs> <laughs> so Peebles runs a left-wing militia. <laughs> it turns out running a left-wing militia pretty hard in a country that's been taken over by the fascists. Mm -hmm. He lasts a while. 73 is when Pinochet is out of power. Most of the resistance is stomped out in a week or so. Peebles isn't captured by the government until 1975, February 1975. So whoever he's, he's pretty canny son of a bitch, but, you know, nobody's that canny. Um, he was initially jailed in a military base, but then early one Sunday morning, soldiers bound him, blindfolded him, and drove him several hours away to Colonia Dignidad. Next, from the American scholar, quote, he was taken to an underground cellar that smelled of linoleum and wood polish, stripped to his underwear and fastened down with leather straps to an iron bed frame. His blindfold was replaced with a leather cap that came down over his eyes. It had a chin strap that held his jaw firmly in place and ear flaps equipped with metal wires. More wires were taped to his ankles, thighs, chest, throat, anus, and genitals, all hooked into a voltage machine. The first session lasted six hours. As Peebles was being shocked, they stabbed him with needles that caused his skin to itch. Then they put out cigarettes on his body and applied a sticky substance to his eyes and mouth. Sometimes, if he screamed, they shoved it down his throat. I mean, I guess at least they polished the floor. Yeah, they did polish the floor. They're Germans. They're clean people. Um, <laughs> sometimes to a problematic degree. Um, so the guy who's doing all this, he, he hears a German man talking. And when all of this becomes public later in Shaper's in the News, he realizes the man torturing him was Paul Schaefer. Um, he was teaching them how to do their job, Peebles later said. He was saying, you have to do it slowly. You have to push here. Once or twice, he punched me very hard below the belt. He realized that they weren't doing anything to me down there. So he said, you should also do it here. And he started beating me. And I think this is him training the kids, the young people. I, I think they're not children at this point, but when they grow up, the ones who don't pull away from him because he molested them, the ones who are like bonded to him because that happens too, mm -hmm. they become like his torture people. Oh, God damn. 
It's pretty bad, Paul. <laughs> this guy, he doesn't know when to quit. Well, no one has stopped him yet. Yeah. <laughs> like, he it's has not, problem. not encountered a tremendous number of consequences to his actions so oh. far. Um, everything's coming up Schaefer um, <laughs> at this point. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, I'm very interested now because we, we've talked about cult people before. And there's always there's always the moment where they go, they do a thing that they like it builds and builds and builds. And there's a thing like, what if I tried this? And then that's when it all falls apart. Yeah. I cannot even imagine what it's going to be for this guy, given it's, what he's already done. I'm, I, I'm interested to see if you'll consider it like, cause it's, it would, it's easy. I know what it is. It, it, it that is coming. Like you're right. You, and you want, you know, your cult guys. Um, <laughs> I'm interested if you'll think it's kind of like a deceleration Mm -hmm. And by the way, because the midpoint of the story is he murdered Santa Claus, like it's yeah, hard exactly. for, yeah, yeah. there's not a lot of pressing the gas from there. I tell you what, if it is a deceleration, that's fine by me. Yeah. I wouldn't say no to a deceleration. Yeah, to like paper. pulling back on that throttle a Jesus little bit. Christ. Yeah. Um, so Peebles survived his experience. And again, one of the Pinochet kills a lot of people, but not, he's not a Dick, he's not a mass murdering fascist on the scale of he's more like um um he's more like Francisco Franco. He's not like a Hitler kind of guy. Like his whole thing is I'm not gonna kill them all. If I torture them until they're too scared to do anything, that's fine. Like Pinochet's body count in the grand scale of dictators is not tremendously high. He tortures a shitload more people than he kills, and he doesn't have peoples killed. Um in fact, the guy's eventually released and he quite wisely flees to Europe, which I think works out fine for Pinochet, right? Um Peebles pieced together what had happened to him over the next several years as new stories began to trickle out about Colonia Dignidad's relationship with Pinochet. Uh, he realizes, oh, this guy who, and again, there's stories filtering back to Europe. Again, we've talked to, there's a couple of people who escape and they go to the media. So for since the beginning, there have been occasional stories in the media about allegations that this this German compound in Chile is host to a pedophile and that in, in once Pinochet is in power, there start to be stories that come out that like they might be torturing some people. Um, so this is, it's there. there's a constant kind of background conversation in Germany and in, and in Europe about what might be happening here. And when Peebles gets to Europe, he goes to Amnesty International. And in 1977, they put his testimony with the testimony of several other people who had been tortured there and survived into a 60 page report with the subtitle, A German Community in Chile, a Torture Camp for the Dina. Schaefer's lawyers filed libel charges against Amnesty International in a German court. This started a legal battle that would last almost 20 years and delay the publication of the report until 1997. So 20 years, they're able to stop this thing from getting out in mass because he's got money. They've got money for yeah. lawyers. You know, yeah, yeah. it's it's the Scientology shit. There's yeah. every so much of all of these different kind of cults that are usually aren't involved with each yeah. other. Usually, like if you've got the hardcore, got to molest children and murder people cult, they don't really have the resources for good lawyers and stuff. You know, Scientology never goes that far with the brutal torture stuff because they the reason that they have the money is that they they keep it on, you know, on the edge of that. Yeah. Schaefer does every all of this stuff. He does all of the quasi respectable making money, interacting with the real world, you know, having a legal team and also the and we're balls out like unspeakable evil kind yeah. of stuff. Like it's yeah, yeah. really a pretty remarkable story. Um so, uh, like other SKPs of the Colonia, people settled in Europe, uh, Brussels to be specific, because again, this goes on for twenty years. So he he does like live a life which is good um and he continues he spends years anytime anyone's willing to talk about paul schaefer he will like tell his story meanwhile the torture continued in fact as pinochet's regime went on uh pinochet came to rely on schaefer more and more in the late 1970s and early 1980s the dina started taking dissidents to the colonia for execution the bodies were eventually buried in mass graves we don't know how many all of them were dug up and burned at some point after this. We know there were mass graves because, number one, you can tell that, like, there was a grave. There's little bits and pieces, you know, of clothing and stuff. The cars of missing persons were found buried on the property and whatnot. So we know w what was going on, but the remains themselves were all destroyed. Again, they're they're Germans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're very thorough. <laughs> um 
Yeah, and uh, former DINA, uh, DINA agents have admitted to taking people there to be disappeared. We, we also do have testimony from people wow. who were like dropping off dissidents to be murdered, who were like, yeah, that's what we did there. Um, again, no idea how many people were killed, but a, a lot, a mass grave number, you know? <laughs> I mean, are uh, these former DINA agents, I mean, where are they that they're in a position to say like, oh yeah, we disappeared all well, these people? After, this is one of those things, when you have... A, a dictatorship like this that ends and it doesn't end in a massive civil war mm-hmm. when it ends in a massive civil war. Yeah. Those guys, when they get, tend to get murdered, if they get caught, right. right? Like that's what you do. If it's a civil war to the old secret police, you, mm-hmm. you fucking kill a lot of them. This doesn't end that way. Pinochet's regime ends, but it's kind of like a negotiated thing. And Pinochet gets to be like a congressman for life kind of thing. Like it's, and things get a lot better in Chile. I, I no one would disagree mm-hmm. with that, but um, they don't, they, they have a truth and reconciliation commission. It's like in South Africa, right? Mm-hmm. This system of apartheid is, but they don't like, they don't like murder all of the people who did right. the apartheid. Um, they have to f- integrate them into society. And so a lot of these guys, they say like, okay, we're not going to, there are some people who do get punished. There are people who go to prison for the stuff they did under Pinochet re- regime. But a lot of these people are basically like, we need to know what happened, but like, we're not oh. going to, to kill you over it. And so, right. and I think there are people who feel bad, yada, yada. I don't want to spend a lot of time like trying to morally no, no, whatever no, no. these but guys. It's but it's basically in exchange for information, we will, yeah. like, we won't execute you. Yeah, we won't, or we won't like, whatever, put you in prison necessarily. Right. Because like, we, we're trying to figure out what happened, who disappeared. There's a lot of people who have questions. I yeah. don't know if my family member was alive or dead. You know, you're trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying to come down one way or the other on it because it's not my country and not my decision what should right. happen afterwards. Um but yeah, that's what it's not. Pinochet's dictatorship doesn't end because the people like murder him, you know. Right. Right. Um, so Schaefer's nickname with the Dina was the professor and the eyewitness accounts of people being sent to the colonia for execution all point to Schaefer being the man who received victims and led them to their execution. He is a hands on dude. Like he's not delegating this shit like Hitler's a delegator. Schaefer is if we're going to be executing people, I'm going to be there. Like, I'm going to be picking them up. I'm going to be taking them to the site. Like, um, one former member of the colony told Bruce Falconer that he had been ordered by Schaefer directly to drive a busload of 35 political prisoners into the hills of the colony and leave them by the side of a dirt road. As this person drove away, he heard machine gun fire. No bodies were ever found. And there's a bunch of stories like that. That's generally how they go. By 1980, the colonia had expanded from its initial 4,400 acres to more than 15,000 acres. A sizable chunk of this was stolen from locals and the Catholic Church. Again, this comes to like you've heard of liberation theology. There's yeah. this chunk of the Catholic Church in South America during this period that's fighting back against all of these like fascist dictators and, and, and militias and stuff. So they don't have a lot of resistance from the Pinochet regime when they just like show up one day. Schaefer has his people like surround this group of nuns who own farmland and is like, what are you going to do? And so they leave and he gets it. Um, Yeah. And this is probably like the mid 1980s is kind of when his control is at its peak. But while his personal control of his cult is at its peak. He's now lost control of the international narrative. And as this Washington Post report from 1980 makes clear, his Nazi past had started to catch up to him on the international stage. Quote, there have also been charges over the years that the colony is a way station in the South American Nazi underground where war criminals wanted by German, Israeli or other authorities are allowed to hide. A Chilean who visited the colony several years ago said that he was told by Ursula, a nurse in the colony's ultramodern hospital, that the doctors there were expert in performing plastic surgery. Last December, Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal said that he had evidence that Joseph Mengele, the Third Reich's infamous angel of death, had lived in the colony for a time last year. The FBI had similar information. And the colony, they have a spokesman. The colony denies that Mengele or any other Nazis live in the colony. We know Nazis live there. Some of them had, like, I was in the, I was in the Wehrmacht or whatever. Right. We, we don't have as much as I want, as it would be good to have on, like, what extent they were actually part of the underground Nazi railroad. Yeah. But it kind of seems like they were a key aspect of helping, like, hardcore war criminal Nazis move around and change their appearance and stay in the underground and avoid prosecution. Um, and it also like everything suggests that that is a thing that he would do that he would, yeah, he would it, make this happen. is the guy. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know if Mingala was there. Um, 
Um, nobody does, obviously. But um, I, I think he helped a lot of hardcore Nazi war criminals hide. Mm -hmm. um, that seems completely on brand for the dude. I mean, why not at that point? <laughs> yeah. And honestly, on the low end of his crimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he yeah. did that to feel more respectable to himself. Yeah. Yeah, just just smuggling some genocide committers. Yeah. <laughs> they already did the genocide. Like, <laughs> you should see the shit I'm getting up to. Um, it is unclear whether or not, yeah, any other famous Nazis uh, hung out there, but there were definitely Nazis. Uh, Schaefer and a lot of the older men were Nazi veterans. Uh, they were huge fans of Pinochet, who was himself a fascist. That 1980 article from the Washington Post is maybe the first place to describe the colonia as a state within a state which it was. And they note that the private airstrips and private communication system would make it simple for someone to fly into the colonia from outside of the country without going through customs or being registered in any way. <laughs> so they're in the ideal situation to help yeah. Nazis stay underground. The reporter on that article noted that he attempted to visit the colonia, but was threatened with arrest by local police, who swarmed him before he could get close and destroyed his film roll, just to be sure. They claimed to be acting on orders from the capital. Quote, the Chilean government takes the attitude that the colony is located on private property, which, unless there is a problem, should not be entered by the police. Neither the police captain who almost arrested me in December nor the government officials in Santiago could explain how the police would know if there were a problem without regularly entering the vast commune. Chilean peasants from the surrounding area, who hold the colony in high regard, are given three medical care at its hospital, but only during certain pre-established hours. One Chilean who spent three nights there said he had uncovered microphones hidden in his room which his hosts then explained were there to anticipate his needs. He also said that he was followed wherever he went and was not allowed to have spontaneous contact with members of the sect. <laughs> I love the idea of explaining a bug by saying, yeah. oh, wait, we just want to know if you want stuff. We just want to be better hosts. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, wouldn't it be better rather than you f having to ask, like, can I make yeah. a sandwich in here? You mm -hmm. know, we just make a sandwich. We because just make we a sandwich you say, for you. I would yeah. like a sandwich right now. Yeah. I'm going to go ask for one. We just want this to be the best damn house. <laughs> hospital you've ever been to <laughs> it is funny that you would oh. even like yeah try to justify it but yeah that is and you also see in that quote everything he's spent years doing coming home like he's got all of this local support not just from the government but from the people like yeah there is no getting in there there's no he has may this might be the most total control i've ever heard of a cult leader establishing yeah like to be honest this is it's wild it's, yeah, it's uh, it's something it's like else. He's got this shit locked up. Yeah, he does. And you know who else has their shit locked up, Paul? Mm, please tell me. The products and services that support this podcast. Ah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Perfect ideological black holes. Inescapable. <laughs> That's the behind the bastards guarantee. <laughs> oh, we're back. Paul, so we just talked about how there's some weird shit going on with Nazis maybe getting smuggled through here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. To yeah. add to that, there's a bunch of stuff we just don't know enough about as I would like. There's a lot of unexplained financial irregularities behind the Colonia and Schaefer. You who was don't funding say. it. Yeah. <laughs> don't say. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I would have thought that's the one thing that Paul mm -hmm. Schaefer <laughs> insisted upon was, I will be scrupulous about the books. <laughs> yeah. That 1980 Washington Post article noted that the Colonia maintained what it called a mother house in Siegburg, Germany, where it would take care of single mothers and would raise funds uh, so they continue to oper operate an orphanage in Germany, which they use. The establishment of this orphanage means there's a charity in Germany, which means anonymous people only described as partners can donate money to that orphanage. And all that money goes to the commune in Chile. And those partners are maybe former members of the Nazi party who are trying to help smuggle people or get funds to them. A lot of this might have been a money laundering operation where... We need to get money to this fucking SS general who's been hiding out in Argentina. We wow. donate to the Colonia. They take a cut off the top and they pass the money on to this guy because they're able to travel without like customs documents. Like all sorts of shady shit is going on yeah. here. <laughs> the thing, the thing to me when it gets to this point, especially when there's, yeah. when there's, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, when there's Christianity involved. Yeah. Is that <laughs> what, what level is, the Christianity 
uh, uh, entering Paul Schaefer's brain at this point? Like, is he, yeah. does he still consider himself a religious person? <laughs> like, I, I say my prayers every night. Um, or is it just like, at this point, it's just like, I am fully, I'm fully embracing my own godhood and the sham. Like, it's always to me the, the balancing, like we talked about before, the balancing of how much do I believe in myself to be this thing and how much of it is just a con and I know it's a con, you know. Yeah. But then when, when, when you still are considering yourself a Christian or you're, you're having some sort of Christian aspect to your scam— like, how much do you believe, like, in our Lord Jesus Christ on high is smiling down upon me and the things that I'm doing? It is, um, I don't know. I, I really have no idea because, like, you're pretty far from the teachings of the Bible yeah, when you are so smuggling Nazis through Latin America in while raping hundreds of children and torturing people for Pinochet and yeah. laundering money and, like, not... Very Christian, I would say. Yeah. Um, That's the uh, only peek I would like into their brains is to yeah. know what are they thinking at that moment? Or uh, like, is there a point where it's just abandoned and they're just like, I got a good thing going here. I'm going to keep it up. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a useful means of control still, you know, to say that, that there's a, there's a power yeah. even greater than me that's guiding everything. And yeah. And that I'm the, like, I, I don't, I have trouble imagining that Schaefer believes in anything but yeah. power and indulging his 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 wants. Yeah. I, I do have trouble believing that. Me too. Yeah. Um I don't know though. Obviously there's a lot of belief in this organization and mm -hmm. a lot of skills. I think there's also just a lot of very cynical Nazis um <laughs> using it for their own shit, right? Which to me um, is the worst kind of Nazi. Yeah. Cynical Nazi. <laughs> at least be a believer, you know? Um God, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, it is hard to like, uh, it's hard to really wrap your head around what is going on in Paul's head if it's anything yeah. but just cold. And it might, because he's he's got to be a calculator, right? Yeah. Like, I could see it just being sort of like a dial tone in there. Just like, yeah. I get what I want. These are the yeah. things that I'm doing in order to get the things that I want. Yeah. And it's not like these guys ever really lay it out at the end where they're like, yeah, no, you know, no. what? it was all no. bullshit. I admit it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, they don't ever do that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There were uh, constant rumors of foreign backers for the Colonia, rumors that old Nazi war criminals had funneled money into it. It's hospital, again, super good at plastic surgery, which is a little odd for a rural Chilean medical facility that deals primarily with obstetrics. Um, they, of course, ran several successful businesses, uh, tortured people for the Chilean state. So a lot of the money may have come from that. It's hard to say. One diplomatic observer cited by the Washington Post noted that, quote, no one knows who was behind the central organization, which he claimed was located in Siegburg, Germany. Um, this guy claimed that they'd put millions of dollars into the colony rather than the fund the colony funding its own endeavors, which I... I just don't know what's going on here. The observer went on to say the religious and social aims of this group are very uncertain. It is all very strange. And that is kind of the untold story here is like how much of this, how much of this, how much of Paul was, if you keep this operation going for these underground Nazis, you can do whatever you want. Like how much was he um, an instrument of other yeah. people who helped yeah, him yeah, get yeah. established and helped him yeah. do all this. I don't know. I don't know how much of that is underpinning this. I don't know if they come in later and are like, shit, this guy's got a good thing going. Let's pump some money into it. And like, we can, we can take advantage. Or if it's from 61, from the very start, there's this shadowy cabal of Nazis being like, we need to build this thing. I, I really just don't know. So Paul um, could just be an innocent dude. Could be an Who innocent is? pedophile <laughs> just, just <a> <laughs> working for the Nazis. Just an innocent Nazi pedophile. He's just a regular Nazi Upon pedophile. Upon a force is greater than him. Exactly. Yeah. We've all felt that way at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um, journalists in 1980 noted how suspicious it was that the Colonia, ostensibly a religious mission, had no church. And I actually think <laughs> they're wrong. That didn't even occur to me. Yeah, there's not a single church there. <laughs> Where are these services happening? Just They're like all in like the, the cafeteria. And I, <laughs> I actually think it's very funny that this religious mission has no church. But I think the think I think the reason these journalists think that it's weird and suspicious is because they don't actually understand what these people believe. There right. was no physical church because Schaefer was the church. 
Mm. Wherever he is, is the church. Right. And he could not abide the thought of worship that was not centered around and directed by him. I mm. think he hated the idea that there would be a church because then people could go there when he was not there and worship. Right. Right. Like I am the worship. I am the 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 vector of this faith. Oh. Um, yeah, that's my suspicion. All the while this is going on, the abuse continued. In 1970, one girl, Matilda uh, Schergelis, uh, wrote to her mother back in Germany, no one is getting in here and nobody is getting out, um, which is certainly how she felt at the time, but is not quite true. Now, Werner Schmidtko was one of the kids we talked about in episode one. He sailed to Colonia Dignidad in 1962 as a two-year-old. And a few years later, he began being molested by Paul Schaefer. Schmidtka tried to escape the Colonia five times over the years. And even though he was never caught in doing this, he was always, uh, he was never, like, he was always, he got out successfully every time. He was always forced to return. Um, and this is what's interesting to me is like he would get out, he would be free and clear, and then he would have to go back because as he explained, I had nobody to go to. As a child, you need your parents to go to, to cry to and say, I can't take it anymore. But the only answer was to run away. So he kept winding up back at the cult after escaping and getting punished and stuff. In 1988... Um, it was, it was 1988, so in, in Werner is escaping a bunch of times. A number of kids get out. A lot of them get brought back. Some of them flee to Europe. But it's 1988 before an escape happens that generates enough news in the right media climate for the international community, Germany in particular, to start taking the allegations of abuse at the Colonia seriously. And it happens when two young people, George and Lottie Packmore, manage to escape to Canada and then get to Bonn, where they testify before the Reichstag that German citizens were being sexually assaulted and forced to stay against their will. Lottie implicated a number of high-ranking officials in the colonia, including Dr. Hopp, saying that he'd been allowed to marry and own a car in return for enabling a regime of mass child rape. Dr. Hopp had been the colonia's foreign emissary. He was the guy who would go overseas whenever there were questions about the colonia. He's the guy who's talking to the press a lot of the time. Um, he had connections with German diplomats. He brought people back sometimes when they would flee to foreign countries. When Lottie had first escaped in 1980. He'd convinced foreign officials to send her back because she was a child. And she claims that when she protested, he threatened her. Another peep out of you and you'll get an injection to keep you quiet. So this is like this is this guy gets to have a wife and a car and a family right. and a job right, right. because he's doing this. Since Paul Schaefer was still a wanted man in Germany, he sent Dr. Hopp to represent the cult in Parliament. According to Reuters, Hopp testified that, quote, the group was one big family, which in a quarter of a century had not a single divorce or suicide and whose members were free to leave at any time and were not subjected to forced labor. Quote, despite this, there have always been people or groups who have slandered our society or individual members in an incredibly scandalous way by feeding misinformation to the press. So this is what he says in his testimony. In 1990, the people of Chile forced Augusto Pinochet out of office via a plebiscite. He stepped down uh, to a term as senator for life, and we'll talk about all this more at some point, I promise. After he leaves office, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is formed to investigate human rights abuses during the regime. Attention was paid, quite naturally, to Colonia Dignidad, and an investigation into missing persons there, including Boris Weisfeiler, who we opened the episode with, started back up. It would be a gross misuse of the word slow to say that justice was slow in this case. For more than half a decade, the colonia stayed closed to the world, due in large part to the fact that the police were still very sympathetic to the old regime, and thus to Schaefer. In 1996, Schaefer launched a new... So, Schaefer's still in control doing his thing after Pinochet leaves, and they're being investigated, they're kind of stonewalling, forcing police out, fighting it in court. Um... And he kind of continues business as usual. And in 1996, he launches a new educational initiative called the Intensive Boarding School. This was an immersive teaching program for local Chilean kids to study and live in the Colonia until they reached 18. Oh, my God. Now, <laughs> oh God. This is really bad. Yeah, it's not great. Like everything else Schaefer did, the intensive boarding school was a way for him to molest a lot more children. Local parents saw it as an opportunity for their children to get a Western quality education and work experience for free. So they sent their kids to the Colonia and... Paul Schaefer molests and a lot of these kids. This situation goes on until the winter of 1996, when a 12-year-old named Cristobal smuggles a note out to his mother. The note read, take me out of here. He raped me. Jesus. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is the bridge too far for whatever yeah. reason. This is the thing that is the step too far. So she rescues him, um, which was a dicey proposition. Very dangerous thing to do. There's armed guards at all times, but she gets her kid out of here. And once they're free, she takes him to a nearby clinic where a doctor verifies that the boy had been raped. This is the first time there is medical evidence right. of, of sexual abuse of one of the kids who is claiming that it's done by Paul Schaefer. She did not believe local police would help her, obviously. <laughs> so she flees to the capital of Santiago and she ta finds the chief of Chile's national detective force, Luis Henriquez. We don't often have cop heroes on this show, but I will give Henriquez a lot of credit here. He is um, a good guy. Uh, he, mm. he, he does the right thing here. And it's one of those things where not a lot of uh, most of the police in Chile are were fundamentally sympathetic to Pinochet. That's why they're willing to protect this massive child rape operation. Right. But Luis Henriquez had been one of Salvador Allende's bodyguards. He had been there in the presidential palace when Allende committed suicide. So he was not a Pinochet loyalist. Mm -hmm. um, and he gets he hears about what's going on and he sticks to this case like glue. In mid-August of 1996, he succeeds in getting a judge to issue a warrant for Schaefer's arrest. Henriquez takes a team to capture the Nazi pedophile cult leader. But Schaefer's got a good intel apparatus. He's got cops inside who are loyal to him, and he gets warned before the raid hits. Bruce Falconer writes, quote, a meeting was called on August 20th, 1996, to discuss what should be done. Schaefer seemed badly shaken. As the colonos discussed how to proceed, he kept his head down and never spoke a word. Shortly thereafter, he disappeared into the colonia's network of subterranean bunkers and tunnels. It is widely believed that he was there, underground, when on November 30th, 1996, Henriquez muscled his way into Schaefer's utopia for the first time. Henriquez had hoped to capture Schaefer by surprise. He went in with 30 armed policemen in a caravan, but as his team made its way up the long dirt road, it was spotted by the Colonia's lookouts, who gave warning. The caravan busted through a sequence of gates and only slowed as it approached the village itself. Henriquez had given orders to his men, should they come under fire, not to retreat, but to move deeper into the village for cover. To his surprise, though, resistance was minimal. The colonos were like zombies, or maybe like robots, Henriquez would later recall. They were machines, on off, on off, on off. They didn't change moods like normal people. Though Schaefer's followers were generally subdued, at times they became aggressive, and in a few cases, they physically assaulted the police. Henriquez assumed these outbursts signaled that they were getting close to Schaefer, but in the end, Henriquez and his police went home empty-handed. Gotta be a, yeah, what a thing to see. Breaking into this cult for the first time, seeing the way yeah. these people react to the outside world coming in. Um, it's really chilling, like the description yeah. of, of how they behaved. Yeah. And uh, so the obvious question is where, where was he? Like wh how w did they, was it, was it that he wasn't there that they couldn't, they couldn't get to where he was or. We don't entirely know the leading theory and Henriquez's theory is that he was there. He was very close by, but they had, they had spent years building a system of underground bunkers. Oh, of and he's course. hiding underground. Of course, of course right? Yeah, of I course this guy's that? got underground of bunkers. He has fucking underground <laughs> bunkers and tunnels. God mm -hmm. damn. Yeah, I mean he's not an unprepared man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> to, to draw another Boy Scouts comparison, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to his immense credit, Henriquez sticks with the case for years. He executes more than 30 raids on the Colonia. They don't capture Schaefer. None of these capture Schaefer, but they all get things. They all find evidence of what's been going on, evidence of the tortures, of the executions, of the child molestation. Um, Henriquez believes that Schaefer probably stayed underground for some time, maybe even years. We don't know when he fled Chile, but at some point in the late 90s, he did finally leave the country. I guess I think Henriquez, I suspect a few of these raids happened and he gets closer and closer and eventually Schaefer's like, they're going to get me eventually. I have to leave. Mm -hmm. And he gets smuggled out. Life in the Colonia changed little at first. One of his senior officers became the new leader um, and they try to keep up a lot of the old rules, but gradually things start to shift and change, right? The molestation certainly seems to have ended when Schaefer left and things 
thaw a bit. Eventually, the colonia adopts a democratic council of leaders. Now, this doesn't work very well. It's dissolved very pretty quickly under intense debate. But gradually, the closed society cracks open and like normalcy starts to creep in. In time, some cult members started to break free of their mental programming. Schaefer's hiding for years. And individuals who had been in the cult and who had been defending him start to cooperate with the investigation, just like the I don't like the term brainwash, but whatever's going on, some of these people realize, like, yeah. you know what, this was this was bad. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Um, some of them are probably people who defended him because they'd been five or six when they came to the colony or even born into the colony, and it it it's not easy to overcome all that kind of programming. Yeah. Um so they start to give more and more information to Henriquez, who just keeps like really doggedly keeps going after this place, keeps trying to figure out what's happening. And gradually these people open up to him. They show Henriquez where the files from Pinochet's torture operations were kept. They hand over information that led to the largest private arms cache in Chilean history. Thousands of grenades, dozens and dozens of rifles, (sighs) surface to air missile launchers. Like he's got (laughs) quite an arsenal. Um, And they also showed Henriquez the site of the mass graves. Um, which again are empty, but there's stuff there that ties back to people who have gone missing. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the tips that Henriquez gets over the years leads to investigators moving Schaefer's bed and finding a trap door hidden underneath it. In the secret chamber, they found what police described as an arsenal of fantasy weapons, the cult leader's private, like, weapons cache. Um, he had three pencils rigged to fire 22 caliber rounds, two <laughs> pencils that could shoot darts. I think these may have been pins and it may be a translation error. Um, cause I don't know how a pencil could fire a bullet without the wood. Uh, maybe it's a mechanical pencil. It had to have been if it's a pencil, um, a camera that could fire darts and several walking canes with guns built into them because Schaefer was a very old man at this point. They found a walker that he had an electrocuting machine built into that could deliver a 1200 volt shock. <laughs> Like fucking that, weaponized that's walker. Cool. That, that's, that's cool. I know, that's pretty cool, right? I'll give it up for I'll give it up for that and only that. For that and only <laughs> that. But the, the weaponized walker. <laughs> all right. Look, oh. we're fair here. <laughs> Every now <laughs> Yeah. It's incredible. Life in the colonia did not become what many of us are likely to consider normal, but it did stop being a child rape cult slash torture site, which is all I've ever asked of anyone. Don't <laughs> don't rape kids and torture people. <laughs> if you do one um, thing for me, make it this. Yeah. <laughs> if you do one thing for me, don't be a pedophile Nazi torture yes, rape that's, cult. And that's all I'll ask. That's all I'll ask. Yeah. <laughs> so meanwhile, Schaefer continued to be in the wind with a handful of his bodyguards. He was eventually tracked down, not by the law, but by a Chilean TV journalist, Carola Fuentes, who spent more than a year tracking down leads. She eventually found him in Buenos Aires, in an expensive gated community. On March 10th, 2005, a 24-member SWAT team busted down the gate and entered his house. Fuentes followed them in order to make the arrest. Quote, I saw this old guy, very lost in space, lying on the bed. He was absolutely not dangerous. I remembered what the bars had told me. He didn't match the image of this bad, evil guy. Schaefer did not resist arrest. As he was being hauled away in handcuffs, Schaefer only groaned and mumbled a question over and over. Why? Why? Do you need a list? (laughs) (laughs) By the way, I we must acknowledge that Corolla Fuentes is an awesome name. Yes. It's incredible. Um, yeah, and, and apparently an awesome journalist. Yeah, and I I oh I was gonna say, is Dwight Schultz still alive? Because maybe he could play the uh the older um uh uh Paul Schaefer. hmm Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and yeah. Maybe a Walton Goggins could play him as a young man. Yeah, yeah, Goggins is what this story needs to really, really pop. Netflix is already there was there was a movie recently made about the Colonia, but it's like a fiction movie. Really? Yeah, it's and it stars like big names. Yeah, 2015, um, a historical thriller uh, starring Emma Watson, Daniel Bruhl, and Michael Nyquist. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, big names. Uh directed by Florian Gallenberger. Um oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's who you get for that. Yeah, Emma Watson. There's an Is Emma it- Watson movie about this. <laughs> if if you 
thought that's what this film needed. Um, I think a Goggins. <laughs> Nothing against Emma Watson, but this cries for a Goggins. It yeah. screams to the heaven, Absolutely. Goggins! <laughs> So um, Schaefer gets extradited to Chile. Uh, in May of 2006, he is convicted of child molestation and sentenced to 20 years in prison. He receives further sentences after this for possession of illegal weapons and for torture. He gets um, more time than he could possibly live for a number of different bad things. Yeah. At one of his first interrogations, he is approached by Louis Peebles, one of the dissidents that he had personally tortured. Schaefer seemed to recognize the man again. He's very old at this point, mm -hmm. And he asks Peebles like, oh, were you a lawyer who worked for us at some point? And Peebles <laughs> responds, no, I was once a guest in your home. You were very unkind. I never did anything to you or the Colonia. So why were you so cruel to me? And at this point, Schaefer stops talking and pretends he can no longer understand Spanish. He can't actually even like, for all that, can't even fucking confront this guy and admit yeah. what he did to him. Um... In 2010, at age 88, Paul Schaefer died in a prison hospital from heart failure. Dr. Hopp, one of his chief lieutenants, lives in Germany today. They refuse to extradite him to Chile to stand trial for his crimes. The German government has a policy of not extraditing citizens for most reasons, pretty much. Um, so he's, that this guy, big part of it, still doing fine. I mean, Germany, I feel like this is a good reason to... Uh, yeah, I feel <laughs> like, I feel like excited. this would be a good reason. Um, <laughs> if you're going to do it for any reason at all, this is the one. I feel like Nazi... Uh, uh, oh, wait, no, no, no. Oh, wait, no, a Chilean co a court. In 2013, yeah, a Chilean court um, could, uh, approved an extradition request. But as of 2018, yeah, that's from 2000, Germany. Won't, the, the, the Guardian article from 2018 is Germany won't jail doctor from Nazi pedophile sect convicted in Chile. Ooh, that's now there's a headline for you. <laughs> there's a headline right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're Germany, if yeah. you're Germany. You might not want there to be headlines that involve the phrase Germany won't jail doctor from Nazi pedophile sect. Yes, this is this is classic. Are we the baddies? <laughs> are kind we of the baddies? situation where it's like, oh, wait, we're Germany. Look yeah. what look where we are in that. You headline. probably ought to get on this one, huh? <laughs> yeah. Does this look bad? Yeah, this might this might look bad. Um, several of Schaefer's lieutenants have been convicted, though, and wrought in a special war criminal prison in Chile to this day. Colonia Dignidad still stands. It now goes by a different name, Paul. It, call, it calls itself Via Bavaria. Um, and it has rebranded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to want a new name after that. That. Is, like, that is like a restaurant in a theme park. Mm -hmm. Via Bavaria. Yeah. It's kind of like how the town of Auschwitz changed its name to Happy Town. <laughs> oh, the branding of this isn't going to go good. <laughs> um, so they are now a tourist destination um, for foreigners. They advertise that it's basically like it's a it's an old German village from the mid century, frozen in time in the middle of Latin America. Come here and stay and enjoy the lederhosen and the bratwurst and the German dances. <laughs> Don't worry, there's no church. Yeah, there's no church. None at all. Don't that ask was... what there used to be here. <laughs> wow, that's that's a hard no thanks from me. Yeah, I don't think I will be going there. I'm very excited to see Chile one day. I don't think I'll be visiting yeah. <laughs> Colonia Villa Bavaria. Yeah. Give it a miss. <laughs> um, in fairness, a lot of the people who run it now were like victims of Shavers, right? Yeah. They were kids he molested. And they're like, this is the only life I know. This is my home. Like, so I'm not going to say they shouldn't like... Oh, hey, yeah, whatever. Absolutely. Like, yeah, I, I'm do, certainly not the person to say, like, do. what you should be doing is <laughs> yes, exactly. one of the kids who survives this. Do what you got to um, do. I will not be swinging by. Yeah, I will not be taking a visit there, though. Um, <laughs> they have returned some of the land that was stolen from people, um, including from the Catholic Church. They gave wow. a, like gave back a bunch of the land that was taken under Schaefer. Um, and oh, in a little bit of God, thank God the Catholic Church got some of their land. Back. Yeah, that was I know you were really <laughs> worried about those nuns. That's all I could think about. Did yeah. The Catholic Church ever get their land yeah. back? That way we know at least some of the land is still being used to abuse children. <laughs> 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 if you're viewing this story a different way and you were afraid there wasn't going to be a happy ending, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. The Catholics are still on the ground. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, the German state has offered a small stipend to victims of Paul Schaefer. It's like a few thousand bucks, basically. Um, although they are emphatic about this, them giving the stipend does not mean they take any responsibility for his crimes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
Which yeah, like, no one's okay. asking that, but you could have taken responsibility for like trying to get him extradited. Yeah. 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 That that makes it seem a little more like you're claiming responsibility. Yeah. That like makes it seem like maybe there were some people in the German government who were involved in funneling money through this in order to protect Nazis. Yeah. And maybe you don't want anyone looking that nah, entirely into oh, it. Boy. Um, I don't know. Paul. <laughs> how you doing? Man, how you holding up? I mean, this is this is the worst one I've done with you yet. Um, yeah, it's pretty bad. This is the worst one you've inflicted upon me. I pretty will bad. not forget this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really like that is just every every aspect of the story is just true, uh, horrific evil. And it's 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 one of those things where you it's it's hard to fathom that this person is the same species as you. You know, that that this is there are people like that that have walked this earth and, and, and currently walk this earth. And maybe we'll find out, um, uh, an even more hideous, uh, a person exists in our, in our, in our midst, you know, that somebody's walking around right now that's, that's committing crimes like this. It's, it's just impossible to wrap your mind around, uh, the, the enormity of it. Yeah, it really is. But I will say, Paul, I have you on speed dial if I do find a story that beats oh, the Santa Claus. I will story. tell you what, that might go right to voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a signal put up in the middle of Los Angeles. <laughs> it's just a silhouette of Santa Claus with a pistol to his head. <laughs> I'll know what it means. I'll, I'll know, know what, what it means. It means. Yeah. Oh, good. Robert did more research. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Paul, got any pluggables to plug? I mean, not right now. Um, I'm, I've got some more live shows coming up in the future, but nothing that's, uh, that's available yet. But, um, but yeah, follow me, um, on, on Twitter at, uh, um, PF Tompkins and my live shows are at, uh, paulftompkins.com slash live. And I update that when I got a new thing. So, um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be announcing things as they are announceable. Yeah. Check out Paul's stuff um, and, uh, I don't know, just check out for a while, chill out. Everybody needs a little bit of, a little bit of time to de-stress from this one. So, uh, for sure. Yeah, go find a cat or a dog somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, okay. Whew.